Good afternoon. Um, I, I am delighted. I am delighted to welcome Monica Peak uh, uh, to our seminar series on healthcare disparities. Um, Monica is an assistant professor in the general medicine section and a member of the RWJ um, National Program Office on Finding Answers, Disparity Research for Change. You remember they're one of the co-sponsors uh, of our series. Um, Monica's research focuses on health disparities, quality of care, the impact of race and culture on the patient-provider relationship, uh, particularly as it, focus, as it affects diabetes health outcomes. Um, Monica currently is funded by the NIDDK and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to investigate racial differences in patient preferences for shared decision making, to explore the barriers to shared decision making among African Americans, and to pilot patient empowerment interventions that enhance shared decision making um, for African American patients with diabetes. Uh, Monica is the co-principal investigator on grants from the NIH and the Merck Company Foundation that aim to improve diabetes care and outcomes uh, among residents on the south side of Chicago. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Monica to our series. Her topic today will be patient perceptions of clinical care and physician communication implications for health disparities. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted and honored to be here. And the longer the series goes on, the more intimidating I became <laughs> with having to give my talk, especially after last week. Stacy was so impressive. So I'll try and do my best, and please bear with me. Um, so I wanted to um, talk a little bit about big picture things and then just contextualize it with the specific issues that I think about, but some of these issues aren't, um, are not broader to healthcare and disparities and, and how we think about interacting with patients. Okay, so one of the big issues is how does communication affect health? So how is it that just talking to someone has implications for your life, your morbidity, your mortality? For me, I specifically think about how doctors and patients talk, and particularly when they are making decisions about treatment and for, about care within that clinical context. But the, the bigger question sometimes is just how is it that talking to people affects your health? How do perceptions affect health? Um, and, and what exactly does that mean? And is there, does it really matter if what you perceive is real or not? And, and ha what are those implications downstream for, for free people's health effects? In particular, for me, I think about perceptions as related to race and the racial filter that a lot of African Americans view their healthcare encounters, and particularly as it interfaces with issues around um, mistrust and perceptions of discrimination and what that means for healthcare. So then, like, how are these things specifically related to health disparities? As Mark mentioned, I spend most of my time thinking about diabetes health disparities, and so the work that I'm interested in about how people talk together and, and think about things has implications for my broader work in diabetes health disparities, and so trying to make those linkages is really important for me, I think, and for our patients. So really what I'm going to be talking about a lot today is the overlay between shared decision making, discrimination, and diabetes health disparities. All right. So I just have to give the obligatory slides about diabetes uh, disparities. So particularly for African Americans, for most racial ethnic minorities, but particularly for African Americans, um, there's a higher incidence and prevalence of disease. So people are more likely to be told they have it, and then over time that group just gets larger and larger. And for people who have diabetes, it tends to be worse controlled. And the comorbid conditions that run with it, so hypertension and high cholesterol, are very frequently associated with diabetes. And those are also less well controlled amongst African Americans. So, and though some of these have synergistic effects. So when we start thinking about complications like retinopathy and end-stage renal disease and amputations, if you have high blood pressure, if you have high cholesterol, you're more likely to have those complications as well. And so, in general, the range is about two to four times the rate of these complications from diabetes and their comorbid conditions amongst African Americans and compared to non-Hispanic whites. And those are stats that occur nationally and locally within our city as well. And in some cases, in some conditions, it's worse than the national averages. So these are disparities in health status about differences in clinical outcomes for people who have diabetes. And there are a lot of things that affect health status, many of which we've talked about in these series where people live and how people live and what they have access to has a huge impact on their health. 
and a much larger impact actually than what we can do as a physician. And I say this, sort of being a physician, spending most of my time thinking about clinical care, I recognize that it's still only a small piece of the pie. So this is sort of with the caveat that most of health status may not be driven by health care, but health care is an important player. And that's the area that I have decided to sort of focus my interest in thinking about disparities in health care as they contribute to disparities in health status. All right, so um, more background, make sure we're all on the same page. The Institute of Medicine had two key reports relatively recently that are, that are really relevant to this kind of work. And one was crossing the quality chasm. And they define quality, quality health care as having six key components, two of which are patient-centeredness and equity. So those are two that are relevant to today's presentation. But they also say that safety, health care should be safe, it should be effective, it should work, it should be timely, it shouldn't take forever to get it, and it should be, um, have some, some modicum of efficiency to it. But the other two are equity and patient-centeredness. And what we know is that for a range of health conditions, a range of clinical scenarios and um, health care uh, outlets, African Americans tend to have lower rates of, or lower quality of care. As an example, uh, fewer visits to their primary care physician, um, fewer eye exams, fewer referrals to the eye exams, and fewer rates of uh, receiving the eye exams. Um, less monitoring of their cholesterol and their diabetes. So the A1C is the measure of a three-month average of people's diabetes control. So less likely for it to have their two major conditions, cholesterol and sugar, uh, monitored for people who have uh, diabetes and less likely to have influenza vaccinations. The Institute of Medicine used this model. It wasn't one they created, but it's one they utilized to sort of think about health care. And so again, they say equity is really important. This report came out, uh, the unequal treatment report said that our healthcare system is not equally distributed. So that's just sort of taking one of those key aspects of quality of care and sort of expanding it to really flesh out what this means about unequal, uh, unequal treatment within our healthcare system. And what they are really, there's, there's a lot of different ways to think about healthcare disparities in care. What they're saying is that this is not care that's related to differential access. So we don't have equal access in this country, but we're assuming that we did. So if we can assume that everyone can get to the doctor with the same rate of efficacy, then that's not what we're talking about. And we're not talking about differences in care that are related to patient preferences or things that are clinically appropriate. So African Americans are more likely to have uh, sickle cell disease. White people are more likely to have cystic fibrosis. I mean, there are, there are differences in screening and treatment and how we think about those things that, are, that really reflect clinical realities. So we're not talking about that. But we're just talking about within what we consider to be an equal access healthcare system, the residual differences that remain that they attribute to mainly two factors, one of which is sort of the ecology of healthcare systems or the infrastructure that's in place that sets up uh, unequal delivery of care and institutionalizes racism, essentially. And the other is the kind of disparity that's due to the interpersonal communication, the discrimination, biases, stereotypes, and uncertainty. I'll talk a little bit more of that in a few slides that occurs amongst people within the healthcare system. So we have systems and we have people that are part of our healthcare system and that's really what they're focusing on when they're talking about the unequal treatment. So that's just a bit of a background. And so we know that discrimination may be one of the things, if not the major thing, that can impact the equitable distribution of healthcare resources in this country. Particularly when we have a system that is not really a good system. It's a, it's a fragmented piece of mess. And so when there's not um, a lot of policy that can sort of shape how the system operates to be efficient and fair, then there's room for a lot of um, uh, things to happen that can, can lead to injustices. We know that African Americans are more likely to report discrimination within our healthcare system. So rates range from 15 to 70 percent depending on the population, when it was me measured, how they measured it. Um, comparison to really any racial and ethnic group, but when we're looking at non-Hispanic whites, the rate is generally pretty low, and the, the, the difference is pretty stark. Okay, so back to that patient-centeredness uh, component of quality of care, which is sort of what I think about a lot. So the Institute of Medicine has defined patient-centeredness as health care that establishes a partnership amongst practitioners, patients, and their families to ensure that decisions respect patients' wants, needs, and preferences and that patients have the education and support they require to make decisions and participate in their own care. It's kind of a mouthful, <laughs> but basically that, that patients feel supported, they have the information, and there's um, an environment that really encourages them to be active partners in their care. And um, so this is really how a lot of people would think about shared decision making, which is sort of the, the, the name that I use for this kind of thing. So we also know that African Americans are less likely to have this kind of patient-centered care, patient-centered communication, their visits are less participatory, um, and they have less shared decision-making. 
So this is all like, to me it's fascinating, but is it really important? And so um, if it wasn't, if it didn't have clinical ramifications, then um, I wouldn't be spending my time doing it. And so, so the question is, wh why is this important? So thinking specifically about the shared decision-making component of our TRIA that we're discussing today. So shared decision-making is central to what we call the chronic care model. So as over the past few decades we have transitioned to how we think about managing chronic diseases like asthma, diabetes, heart failure, um, depression, we have moved from a more paternalistic model to one where patients are really center and where patients do a lot of their management at home and so a lot of guidelines are coming out saying uh, so patients can have their own peak flow meter at home and when their asthma gets to a certain point they know they're supposed to do this versus this so that people can feel more empowered to manage their own disease and not just have to come to the emergency room or have to call the physician when their health is, is, is not going as well as, as anticipated. And so having activated patients that can understand their disease, that can communicate with their physician, that can manage their stuff at home and then sort of bounce it up is really how we're now thinking is the best way to manage people who have chronic diseases. So shared decision making is really sort of a core part of this new paradigm for chronic care management. It also has huge uh, correlations with health out indicators. So people who are engaged in sharing about decisions with their medical, with their physician about their medical care have better control of their diabetes, better blood pressure, they're less likely to be hospitalized, their visits are more efficient, which people always ask me about because if people are doing all this talking, how, how, how are visits efficient? Um, <laughs> part of that is defined in like the words per minute. So people are able to get more information across in a shorter period of time. And if people can do some of the front work during those first few visits and get sort of a baseline of who they are and what the issues are, then subsequent visits can be actually shorter. Fewer malpractice claims and less doctor swapping. And there's a huge um, personal health and financial cost associated with frequent doctor swapping. And so those also go down as well. And we're just now, over the past few years, starting to think about or starting to sort of elucidate some of the mechanisms that link shared decision making with these positive health indicators. And some of those are self-efficacy, patient satisfaction, trust, patient understanding of the disease process. And so there is, um, well, I'll tell you about it in a little bit. There's another study I was going to mention. Okay. Okay. Is there data on that fewer hospitalizations? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try to only put things up here that actually have facts behind them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the blatant lack of references, <laughs> um, everything up here uh, has science behind it, yeah. Okay. Um, what there hasn't been done previously, and this is sort of, I've been working on this for a couple of years now, um, work on racial differences in shared decision making per se and how uh, and the impact of shared decision making on diabetes health disparities. Okay, so this is, um, do, does anyone recognize these pictures? Yeah, yeah okay, so we all know. All right, so this is uh, just contextualizing this, this co the concept of discrimination within the healthcare setting. Um, and I say this because a lot of people assume that when physicians take our Hippocratic Oath that somehow um, there is a miraculous magic process that um, makes us free from any inherent stereotypes or biases that we may have had through our whole lives or just that we're able to really do what we're, I, we strive to do, that we want to do. We want to be good physicians and give good care and not be biased in our assumptions, but there's not really anything magic that happens just because we get a medical degree. And it's, it's naive to think that somehow healthcare systems and healthcare personnel are immune to the very air and water that everyone breathes that has to do with race in this country. And so um, we're not <coughs> immune, unfortunately. And what social scientists tell us is that the way that we process new information about people is something that everybody does. And, it's part, and I think it's going to only get more as we have increased amounts of information that's given per like minute. All the tweeting and all the other things that, that I don't even know how to do, but I know it exists. <laughs> that's a lot of information. And so one of the ways that we can try and process that and stay, on, stay sort of in control of all that information and not get bogged down is to put people into categories by gender, by race, by income, by whatever. And so that when we see a person, we're not like, oh, who is this new person? I wonder what they're about. We're like, okay, this is a middle-aged African-American man, looks kind of disheveled, maybe he's homeless. Or, you know, we try and, you know, unconsciously try and get a sense of who people are really quickly. Um, and it helps us sort of get through the day other than, you know, I have two-year-old twins. And so if the whole world was to us like it was to them, we would never, like, 
make it to our front door at work. And so it helps us become more fast and efficient and, and sort of get through the day. But it obviously has shortcomings. Um, so that what happens is that people have a tendency to exacerbate or exaggerate the negative differences that exist between groups. So that's stereotyping. So that if there's a small difference, maybe people uh, blow that up to be a bigger difference if it's a negative one. And they tend to generalize those differences to everybody in that group. So maybe there's 10% of the population that has you know, X problem, and our tendency is to sort of say, well, maybe it's everybody. Maybe every black man on the south side belongs to a gang, and if I see him walking down the street, I better run for my life. So those are kind of shortcuts that we use that obviously have bad sort of outcomes and, and things that we do, but it's part of everybody's human working. It's part of our DNA. We should all, just all, all admit that. There are certain conditions that really kind of bring that out. So when we have to use these sh cognitive shortcuts are when we have to. Well, we sort of use them uh, subconsciously, but we are more likely to use them when we have a little time to make a really complicated decision with limited information and a lot of uncertainty. And all of those exist in the clinical encounter. So if you're in primary care, I had a clinic yesterday, and you get 20 minutes to see a patient who has 15 active medical problems and came in with three new ones, um, then you're, you're processing a lot of information. And God help you if that's not your real patient and you're just subbing in for someone or it's an acute visit or something like that. And so you're, you're trying to get a sense of all this with limited information about the patient, limited testing and, and uh, objective information. And so we tend to do that. If you're in the hospital setting, uh, now we have to get the, the residents and house staff out really quickly. Residents or rounds have to be done at a certain time. There's a lot of pressure. You know, I can only see them so fast. And so both inpatient and outpatient care have a lot of cognitive demands and time pressure demands, volume demands that really make us more rely on these cognitive shortcuts that we probably have not even processed to know exactly what they are, but we're using them subconsciously to make decisions about people and then subsequent decisions about the care that we're actually delivering. So this study was one that everyone in the room knows about, um, published in the New England Journal, that was looking at the effect of race and gender on physician recommendations for cardiac cath. So people came in with chest pain, and the question was, do they need to have additional testing looking at their heart's arteries with you know, shooting dye in their leg and taking a picture of their heart's arteries to see if they need to have a bypass surgery or you know, um, some other sort of cardiac intervention. And the clinical stories were exactly the same. The only thing that was different were how people looked. So they had, uh, so this is half, they actually had two black women, two black men, two white women, two white, white men, but you get the picture. So they only differed by gender and by race. And the effects for both race and gender was exactly the same. So if you were a woman, you had 60% of the odds of being referred for a cardiac cath than if you were a man. And if you were black, you had 60% of the odds of being referred for a cath than if you were white. And God help you, if you're a black woman over here, compared to the white man over here, you had 40% of the odds. So there's that sort of dynamic. Um, and so that was really shocking to a lot of people because we had there was nothing else that was different about that. And in real life, there's always, there's no two people that are exactly the same. But these are people that were exactly the same because they were fake. And so, uh, <laughs> so it's really sort of eye-opening to a lot of people. And that, and that was not the only study that has tried to figure out a way of, of tapping into our, un, our subconscious bias and what, what happens and how we make decisions. And there's new instruments for measuring things like implicit bias that are coming out. And all of it is really um, eye-opening and concerning, I think, for us in the medical field, that we have baggage that's in us that we aren't really sure is there. And there was a different study that actually asked physicians, you know, some scale about how biased you are, and who's going to say that? But of course, everyone said no. And then, <laughs> <laughs> but when they did this implicit bias test, they were found that people, there were not only differences in how they saw people, who's going to, you know, adhere to the plan of care, who's, who's going to do whatever, but that, in fact, uh, affected their treatment recommendation, recommendations for, again, cardiac care. So these are things that aren't just sort of pleasant interpersonal things, they're things that have real implications for the kind of care recommendations that we give people and how people are perceiving the kind of care that they're receiving and whether or not they're actually going to adhere to that plan of care. So, so that's one thing. Um, so there's actually been sort of an explosion relatively recently thinking about perceptions of discrimination and its impact on health. Most of that has come in the area of societal discrimination, so what we call sort of everyday discrimination. So you go to the store and you're last in line, you, you go to blah, 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 and the police pulls you over. Like, there's sort of the daily hassles um, that aren't 
major, um, but it's just sort of the everyday nuances that, that happen to racial and ethnic minorities. Those kinds of um, measurements of self-reported uh, self discrimination have been uh, associated with a lot of health conditions. Um, self-reported self-reported um, poor health, hypertension, chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, they spend on well in bed, alcohol use, cigarette use, a whole bunch of stuff. And the, the thought is that it's not, that for this kind of health effect, it's mediated through physiologic changes from stress. So they're using um, stress and the sort of chronic stress model and how it causes dysregulation in the autonomic nervous system and the immune uh, system and other sort of systems of care that things just kind of go awry, awry and start having complications and downstream health effects. Now for discrimination in healthcare, this is a very much more nascent area where we don't really have a lot of good information about what's in the black box for the mechanisms or even what the associations are really. So we're just now starting to look at some of this. What we do know is that there have been associations between self-reported discrimination within healthcare and measures of preventive care like cancer screening, cholesterol screening, influenza vaccinations, and then um, delays in medication use and medical testing and treatment. So the assumption is that people are wary about the recommendations they're getting and try and decide if they really want to do it or not, and then ultimately decide to or, or not, um, and then patient satisfaction. And there really hadn't been a lot of work done with the impact of discrimination on shared decision making or on diabetes health outcomes. And I'll actually, let me just back up and say here, in case I forget to say later, the obvious is that unlike societal discrimination, healthcare discrimination has the unique pot uh, potential to directly impact someone's health. And so it's not really clear whether or not people's stress when they come to the doctor where they're already feeling sick and vulnerable, um, that additional stress is what may be changing their physiologic path line, or if people are reacting to reality and are getting uh, unjust distribution, distribution of healthcare services, and that is the mechanism for which their health is being affected. So does that make sense? So if, if a policeman stops me on the road, that doesn't directly affect my health unless like I get put in jail and lose my job and lose my health insurance. But if a physician is doing something, maybe he won't order the right test or maybe he like won't give me the newest medication or whatever. And so there's a tighter link between what's happening in our healthcare system to what's happening in the rest of society as far as discrimination and its impact on health. All right. So these are two papers that came out in the past couple of years looking at, and this is about societal discrimination, but just to kind of give you an idea, one of them was looking at self-reports of uh, everyday discrimination was associated with elevations of C-reactive protein, which is sort of this broad inflammatory marker and has been associated with cardiovascular disease as well as coronary artery calcification. So this is part of the Swan Heart Study, which is just a huge multi-center study looking at um, women and heart disease. Um, and so these are some of the kinds of research that are coming out now trying to figure out exactly what some of the physiologic links are between this experience and how it affects the body and how that ultimately will downstream affect health. Okay, so then this is our conceptual model that really tries to think about within the clinical setting how issues of race and culture ultimately affect this patient-provider relationship through some of these normative beliefs that we were talked about, through issues of mistrust, which is sort of legendary amongst the African-American community with Tuskegee and all these other things, perceptions of discrimination, how those affect this relationship. And in the setting of that relationship is where shared decision-making really has to occur. So people, patients have to want to have a shared decision-making you know, relationship, providers have to want it, but they also have to have a relationship that's conducive to that. Um, and so all of these things are variables which are in play when we're trying to decide whether or not that's actually going to happen or not. And then here is just some of the mechanisms, again, of how we think that may actually play out for health outcomes. And there was a paper that came out just this year, uh, I guess just last year, it's 2011 now, that looked at, because most of the papers are cross-sectional. So you have associations, but it's not really clear which came first or which driving something, but they looked actually longitudinally. So they had a cohort of people where they um, had the physicians really engage their patients. So they had this active participatory effort at baseline. And they measured that, and then later they were tracking changes in patients' sense of activation and empowerment, and that improved. And then that tracked with self-efficacy, which then tracked patient adherence to medications, and then they were seeing improvements in A1C and LDL. Blood pressure was kind of borderline. So that, that's not the only study, but that's one that has, is a nice sort of longitudinal timeline, but there's others that have evidence that support a model of something like this. The other thing to note with this conceptual model is that, so there's perceptions of discrimination sort of as it may play out 
within the relationship between patients and doctors. But there's also this sort of this big arrow over here on the side, and this recognizes the fact that some patients may just leave the health system altogether. Say, I had a bad experience, I don't want to trust doctors, I'm going to just go sit in my home and hope for the best, and then show up, you know, in florid congestive heart failure or, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis or something. And so there may be health outcomes that un are ultimately unrelated to the healthcare system if someone opts out of the system. All right. So these are a few of the research questions that um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing and then tell you about an intervention that we've been working on. So the first is why are there racial differences in shared decision making? Why? Why does that happen? Um, does perceptions of racial discrimination in healthcare affect diabetes outcomes? And then can we actually develop culturally tailored interventions to improve this shared decision making process and impair, empower African American diabetes patients? So the first question um, has several subparts, one of which is do African American patients define shared decision making differently? We say what? Isn't there a prior question? Hmm. And, and the prior question would be um, what, what sort of model of the doctor-patient relationship would, would patients want? Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that's not been studied very often. Um, and I'm talking not, not just in, in terms of African Americans, mm -hmm. but in patients generally. I mean, what, what, what percent of our patients want this, this model? Right compared to, let's say, a passive or paternalistic, exactly. passive model, or for that, or, and then maybe into also contrasting a really vigorous autonomy model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's about 85% want shared, about 5% want an autonomous model, consumerist model, um, and then the rest, about 10% want a passive role. And, that's, and that would be in this population that you're, you're studying, or, or, or in general? In general, okay. in general. Mm -hmm. model correct for language and cultural differences because the challenge is sometimes uh, how is a physician to uh, be the custodian of all knowledge for different people that mm -hmm. come through your office. Right. But I think that's very... Certain. It's challenging. Nobody is more than one person. <laughs> we have lots of different kinds of patients. So there's no one who's going to be a perfect match by gender, class, race, you know, country of origin, favorite food, you know, there's just like too many things, too many things. And we're only, we only live in our own bodies. And so there is issues around how do we maximize our ability to connect with those pe people given our inherent limitations. And so there's a whole body of work around cultural competence and how do we try and um, not just understand about different cultures, but how do we change ourselves and look internally and be open to understanding new cultures. And so I have a couple of my patients who I think love me the most. I don't, they don't speak English and, and I don't speak their, their language, but we like hug a lot when we see each other and I have on the back of their forms that I keep how to say keywords in their language. Um, and so I try and use those, probably botching them, but I think they appreciate that I'm trying. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it does create an additional barrier, but I think barriers, I think any barrier can be overcome, including cultural barriers. So. Um, okay. And, and I'm open to questions. I feel so free that I have an hour and a half. I normally talk really, really fast because I'm trying to get it all in. And so now I just feel like, you know, we can play all day. So um, <laughs> I, I won't keep you past 1.30. <laughs> okay. So uh, this first question about are there differences in how people actually define that? So this is a paper that we wrote um, looking specifically at that question. And what we found is that um, when a lot of researchers get in the room and sort of think about this, we don't always have a lot of patient feedback and loop in how patients think about things, and there's not always a good match. And the research is starting to show that for a range of different kind of patients, there's not a good match. For the African Americans with diabetes that I studied, there also wasn't particularly a good match. Not a bad one, but, but, but not, it would be different in some key ways. So, <clears throat> for example, uh, the three sort of domains of shared decision making, which are generally accepted to be the common ones from Kathy Charles, she's sort of the dominant uh, personality in this, is information sharing, deliberation, and decision making slash implementation. So, doctors and patients get together and talk, 
Doctors tell you what you think is wrong. <coughs> Patients say, oh, my head hurts and, you know, whatever. Um, then there's a deliberation about options. Well, we can get a CAT scan. I can give you some Tylenol. You can call me tomorrow or we could do blah, blah, blah. And then ultimately a decision gets made about what the plan of care is. So that's sort of what's supposed to be happening that patients and doctors are contributing to each one of these phases as people sort of march through the clinical encounter and think about a clinical illness. Now, here's what we found. Um, so patients did say that yes, physicians should be doing some stuff and patients should be doing some stuff. And we really actually heard a lot that patients wanted to have their story told and have their say. And so we all, as clinicians, have some patients who really like to talk and we just have to let them run, run their course for at least a good two minutes because if we don't, they're going to feel really, really frustrated and still keep coming back to that story that you keep trying to cut off. And so they, and that is really important to them. And that says things that you wouldn't necessarily understand. It says that you validate who they are as a person and that you really want to hear about them and you care about them. And they really want to sometimes get that out. And we heard that a lot in our focus groups. Um, and so, um, but one of the other things that we heard is about the deliberation process. A lot of people said, I never knew there's more than one option. Like I've never been told by my physician that there's more than one way to skin a cat. That there, there's two, two different pills I could have taken, or there's you know surgery versus physical therapy, or like this was like new revelation to so a number of our patients, which was really sad actually. Um, so we kind of broke it down, but this, this is how patients were mapping what they considered to be shared decision making. So let's say that the doctor only offers one option. You can either follow the advice regardless of if you like to or not. You can actually say. Mm, I'm not sure about that, tell the doctor, or you can just decide on your own quietly at home. You can behaviorally agree or disagree by adhering or not adhering to the plan of care. And then if you do have several options, then you can either make your own choice, disagree or agree with the doctor, adhere or not adhere to care. And all of this, all of this, patients would consider to be shared decision making because maybe there are some people who said, really the most important thing is this part, the information sharing. I don't really care so much about the other part. So if I get this, I'm sharing. And so there was a lot of uh, heterogeneity in, in what we were learning about what was important to people and, and how they define that. Um, and the key th one of the key things, I guess I'll just go back, is the, um, this area of adherence. I really want to underscore that because we really frown upon non-adherence in, in clinical medicine because we're giving treatment plans of care that we think will help people live better and, and live well. And so when patients don't do them, we get frustrated. We start like not wanting to see them in the office. We think that they're not committed to their care. And so it just sets up a whole lot of badness. And what we were hearing is that many patients didn't feel empowered enough to say, I don't want to do that, or I don't know how to do that. I can't afford to do that. If I do that, I'll have no more money to feed my kids. Like, you know, so they just would say, okay, doctor, thanks, and then go home and not do it. And then you come back three months later and the blood pressure's still the same and like, oh, why are you not taking pills? So it's just like this thing that patients were viewing entirely differently. That's their way of having some sort of sense of control and ownership and sharing in the process. They're being an active player, whereas physicians were like, what are you doing? Like, you don't, you're just lounging at home, not paying attention. You don't do what I tell you to do. And so the, how people were interpreting that, I think was really, interesting for me and it has changed how I interact with my patients specifically in trying to bring those things out. Okay, so this is just a few quotes. So people that we would have said were passive, who again, everyone else in this paradigm said that they were active. So one person says, she said that I should start taking insulin and diabetes pills and then she started getting loud. But I don't want to take anyway. And I try to do what's best for me and that's, and that's it. I'm a praying person, loving the Lord, and I try and do what's best for me, I take all my medicines. So she really doesn't want to take her medicines, but the doctor tells her to, she's going to do it anyway. She considers herself to be involved in shared decision making. Then there are some people who either agreed or disagreed verbally or behaviorally. So one example was, we sit there in the office and she tells me, she starts laughing, she tells me what to do, and if I don't like it, I'll say, no, I don't want to do that. I'm 73, year old, 73 years old, okay? Some things we just know we ain't going to do. <laughs> So this is another patient. These are all patients at our medical center, by the way. The doctor told me I need to go to the dermatologist. Now the lady up there at the checkout desk, I told her that I didn't want to go. That is, if this little skin growth goes down, I don't see a reason to operate. So I have to think about that. And then the moderator says, well, did you tell your physician? Oh, well, I didn't tell my doctor about my preference for not messing with it. I just told her I'd go through with it. So, and this was not the only thing. So for people who don't interface with the healthcare system a lot, most of the front desk staff are black. 
um, a lot of the medical assistants are black and a lot of the physicians are not black. So this lady had something, her doctor gave her some advice. She's like, I don't think I want to do that. Seems too much. But I told the lady at the checkout desk, who has nothing to do with her care, <laughs> what she thought about it and what her plans were and, you know, all it's and, yeah, craziness. But anyway, so, so that's how <laughs> she was sort of maintaining control and having a sense of good stuff. Oops. Um, and then the last would be autonomous patients. Um, so I want it to be a shared decision, but I make the final call. I wouldn't mind some input from my doctor, but I, <laughs> but I want to make the final decision. And again, all of these are people who said, yes, check the first box. I want shared decision making. I, I, I love shared decision making. So there's, uh, the, the, there, and so for each one of those little boxes, we have quotes and theories and a whole lot of stuff. But these are just a, a little sampling of some of the things that we were learning about how people were thinking about this process and what it meant to them to talk to their doctors and to have some ownership over their care. Um, so then the next study was, are there di racial differences in patient preferences? So again, thinking about the conceptual model, doctors have to want to do it, patients have to want to have it, they have to like each other enough to want to do it with each other. So um, are there racial differences in patients? Do black people in general, defining it however they want to, want shared decision making less? And that's why they're getting it. Who knows? Completely unanswered question until now. So um, this paper came out recently, actually. It's the first one we started working on. It's the last one that came out. Um, this was a, a study of about 1,000 patients who were getting care at community health centers in the Midwest and in the Near West region. And um, we, it was a survey analysis, cross-sectional survey. So what we found, so there are a couple of items. So one question was, patients and doctors should be equal partners. It's like saying, do you like apple pie? Everybody said yes. 93% of all people said yes, and there are no group differences between the two. But when we actually looked at the Likert scale responses and looked at just the strongly agrees, African Americans were much more likely than whites to strongly agree with that statement about equality and having equal partnerships. Then there are three other questions that hung together, so we had them as a composite measure and then we looked at them separately. And um, African Americans were more likely to strongly agree with a passive, a strongly disagree with the passive role. So leaving decisions to their doctor, should their doctor decide what gets talked about in that uh, a patient uh, clinical encounter, and then should you rely exclusively on your doctor's knowledge. So all of these African Americans were more likely to strongly disagree for, and only the last one did we not lose statistical significance. And then we ran them each through multivariate logic models, there were no differences at all. So basically, African Americans, from what we can tell in the study population, wanted shared decision making as much as our non-Hispanic white counterparts when you're adjusting for race and class and, not race, but, but class and education and duration of the patient-provider relationship and all those things, and maybe a little more so. <coughs> Hard to say. That study also looked at patient behaviors, which is relevant to the previous one because the people are defining behaviors in different ways. You know, what exactly, how does all that shake out? So we looked at that too. What we found, same study, was that African Americans were more likely to initiate discussions about diabetes care in four of six measures. So for blood pressure, oh wait, wait, so these four. Um, so blood pressure, an eye exam, foot exam, microalbumin, which is a test, or an early test for pre-kidney disease. Um, African Americans were more likely to initiate those discussions themselves. They were not more likely, but not less likely, um, to initiate discussions about monitoring for their sugar control or their cholesterol control. And so these were just bivariate um, associations, but when we put them in a, <coughs> lumped them together and adjusted for other factors in the multivariate logic model, the odds ratio was nearly two, so 1.78 um, for African Americans initiating discussions. So it wasn't just that people were saying, I prefer a shared role, and really all I want to do is tell my doctor that, um, you know, I'm feeling woozy because my sugars are too high. They really want information um, that's related to the care delivery that they're receiving. Um, so that we thought was important also. Um, so then a lot of unpacking had to go about with the whole issues of race. How does race affect the patient and provider behaviors? And does perceptions of bias and racism and mistrust play a role in how people are perceiving this process? Okay, so that was a couple of papers, which I'm going to summarize in one slide, I think. So for race and shared decision making, what we heard about patients, these are all from patients. Um, this is a qualitative study. So the effect of race on shared decision-making processes, so thinking again about those three domains of information sharing. So they said patients may be more likely to share information about their symptoms or their concerns in light of race and racial issues because they may be thinking that they're going to be looked down upon or that if they tell the doctor they couldn't afford the medicine or couldn't take it, that that will be seen particularly negatively if they're African-American. And so they may just withhold some information and not be as forthcoming. 
that in that sort of deliberation process, they may be less likely to speak up and actually question the authority of the physician. And that during the final decision-making process, they may be less likely to adhere to treatment plans, which again is an echoing of um, the, the previous study that I was talking about. So one of the quotes says, uh, there are very few African Americans that would question the treatment that they would get. I have a neighbor, and she goes to the doctor, and when she gets medication, she throws it in the garbage can. I love that quote. It's so crazy. <laughs> Why does she go to the pharmacy, stand in line, pay her good money, get the medication, and take it home, and then throw it in the garbage can? Like, I, I, <laughs> I laugh every time I see that. But she does, <laughs> according to her, her neighbor. So, and, and so why is that? There's this sort of weird ambivalence or dichotomy that people live in where, on one hand, doctors and health systems are good, I should do something, but on the other hand, I don't know if I really trust it, and what, so these two or three people living in the same person having all these different behavioral manifestations in their healthcare system. And that is really very fascinating to me, and how we can try and identify all these different parts and, and leverage them for good, so there's not all this sort of uh, schizophrenic behavior that happens with the same person. For physicians, um, people told us that with information, they felt like doctors were less likely to give information, like medical explanations and test results, either not tell them at all or just withhold the bad parts or sort of tell them a half story, which is what physicians used to do all the time back in the day um, to protect patients. Um, the doctors were less likely to listen to African-American patients, so the, the time spent listening and then the quality of the, the listening relationship. Um, that they may be more domineering over their African-American patients, so trying to, someone will start saying something and then the doctor would just sort of start talking, getting louder, trying to talk over them. Um, doctors may be more likely to talk down to the African-American patients and that they may be less likely to consider patient preferences for treatment. So this one person said, my mother always said, the doctors did not tell me the thing that would happen to me. And I only wondered in my own mind whether that would have been a race thing. Maybe they assumed that she would not understand and we should just do this, do that, take this, take that, without a reason why. But my mother was an intelligent woman. So this is her daughter sort of reflecting upon what she saw with her experiences with her mother and trying to figure out why things weren't good and it, did it have something to do with race because education and intelligence didn't seem to be an issue. All right, so back to this model. Um, and I only sort of put that in here as a reminder for me that we're going to now transition to thinking about this black box right here of perceptions of discrimination. So this is uh, the study that we did with the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Study, so a national study that um, 2005 started having a reactions to race module, so they asked people about um, your self-identified race and ethnicity, and then what other people think your self, <laughs> what your race and ethnicity is. So your socially assigned race and your self-identified race. They ask about people's perceptions of discrimination within healthcare. They ask about people's reactions to that, like do you feel physically ill? Do you get you know psychologically distressed? Did you cry? Um, and a couple of other questions, that sort of all in that reactions to race module. And that's an optional module, so there's sort of the core requirements and then a couple various module states can choose to pick up b based on how much money they have and what they consider their public health needs to be. So we looked at states that had the optional diabetes module. The basic one just says, do you have diabetes? And if you have the optional one, you have all these sort of questions about diabetes care and processes and what you're doing. So we used states that had that one and the reactions to race module and sort of were looking at associations between self-reported uh, discrimination in healthcare and several uh, classes of diabetes measures. So. This paper, um, this is a, a table which I know I shouldn't even put up because it's so small, but I couldn't get it on more than one. So what uh, key findings are that here, so I'm going to stand, uh, quality of care, we have four measures that we looked at. The, the number of diabetes-related primary care visits, monitoring for <coughs> diabetes control, so testing for hemoglobin A1C, the interval for the eye exam, and foot examination. And these are all sort of standards of care from the American Diabetes Association. Then there are two measures for self-management. So are you checking your sugars by yourself at home? And do you check your feet at home as you should be? Um, oh, and then the third one is, have you gone to a diabetes edu education class before? And then we had two measures of diabetes complications. So diabetes-related foot disorders, which are a precursor to amputations, and then diabetes-related retinopathy, which is a precursor to blindness. So those are two huge, life-changing complications that disproportionately affect racial and ethnic minorities. So um, we found that People who reported racial discrimination in healthcare had less than half the odds of three of the four diabetes care measures. So 0.38 for primary care visits, 0.42 for A1C testing, 0.48 for the, an appropriate uh, interval for an eye exam. And then more than twice the odds for diabetes-related complications. So 2.32 for foot disorders and 2.26 for diabetes-related related retinopathy. And there was no change in any of the measures for self-management. Let's play a little statement about the um, 
self-management because it has, it has, it's important for two reasons. One, a lot of the models that think about the mechanistic pathways between discrimination and health have some sort of negative health-promoting behaviors in them. So I get really stressed, I'll smoke some cigarettes, or I'll eat a lot of food, or I'll do some other things that aren't good for my health that make me feel a little bit better. And so patient behaviors are on the causal pathway and a lot of theories between health outcomes and perceptions of discrimination. Now, we measure things that aren't satisfying. And I, we didn't say, are you eating a Twinkie? We said, are you checking your sugars? Are you checking your feet? Did you go to a class? So these may not be the kinds of measures that would change um, or be part of that pathway, but at least what we saw is that there didn't appear to be um, a relationship between what people were doing at home and what they were experiencing or what interpretations of what was happening in the healthcare system. So, all right, I'm gonna move to the next slide. Um, so then, next slide, uh, many of you have seen two weeks ago when I did RIP with Marshall, um, is can we develop culturally tailored interventions to improve shared decision making and empower African Americans with diabetes patients? So this is, the start out as a CTA pilot that was done at Booker and then we got some additional grant funding to be able to ramp it up at other clinics and have a lot of other things that are with it. So, um, so, so, that's what, so it's a patient education pilot that now has a lot of other stuff that are, that are interrelated. So this is me and Marshall in DC. So our initial funding came from the Merck Company Foundation in sort of collaboration with the CDC and the Office of Minority Health. Every time I see that picture, I laugh because I was six weeks postpartum and I was like so tired. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I just want to go lay down now. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. Anyway, um, so that's us. This is sort of, this, this little part of the talk is about sort of diabetes and us here in Chicago. So as Stacy mentioned last week, we don't have good stats. These are 2004 data. But the death rates for diabetes in communities are highest sort of in these concentrations on the south side. And we always have our little, you know, Hyde Parkish little blip right there that's always surrounded by a lot of craziness. Um, and so we have a lot of diabetes death around us. We have a lot of poverty around us. So eight of the 10 Chicago's lowest income neighborhoods are in our hospital's primary service area. And again, H is where we sit, and then we have a tight link of poverty right around us. So this grant is really sort of thinking about specifically interventions on the south side of Chicago, recognizing that as a community, we have a lot of challenges distractions, things that are going on that make it hard for people who live at home to have a safe place to eat and to exercise and to manage their diabetes and to think about their illness and not get all stressed out. But we're also on the South Side of Chicago, which has a long, like, rich historical legacy. There are amazing community organizations that are here and that have been here for decades. And there's a lot of regrowth and good stuff that's happening here also. So we're trying to acknowledge the craziness and try and embrace the wonderfulness um, that's here in our community and trying to figure out how we can make something that works. So this is, um, oh, more nice pictures. Community gardening, new home. Okay, so, um, so this is our team. Lots of folks, lots of great important people. And we're really trying to improve the access to care, quality of care, and clinical outcomes. Long-term goals, do good stuff, good, good partners. This, uh, we have six clinics, two of which are access clinics, uh, two other FQHCs affiliated with the university, and then our primary care group and diabetes center here on campus. Um, and I, I mention all this in the setting of patient communication training and patient activation. That's the core that I'm leading and spend a lot of time thinking about and is using information that I learned with the qualitative and quantitative work to sort of develop this thing. So these are classes that talk about patient empowerment. They have culturally tailored diabetes education and shared decision making about information sharing, deliberation, decision making, which we call discuss, debate, decide. We have these, we have these fun stuff. So we have these interactive cards, this game built on who wants to be a millionaire. We have the video that people really like. The classes are intensive. They're 10 weeks long. We're trying to start, shorten that um, for several hours at a time. But people really gain. So a good number of people came all the time. 86% of people came at least 70% of the time, and then half the people, no, everybody came at least half the time. And we saw improvements in, oh, that was the video, sorry. Uh, improvements in measures of self-efficacy, as well as self-management, particularly in certain aspects of healthy eating. Everything improved, but there were like 20 people in the pilot, so some of them are statistically significant and others aren't. Other areas of diabetes management, like exercise, checking your sugars, inspecting your shoes, those kinds of things. Related to this, I'm going to tell you just a few other parts of the moving piece because they're related to patients and how 
They may be changing the perceptions of their clinical care, how they interface the care system, how we can put a better human face as we're interfacing with our patients who may come with a lot of baggage around healthcare, and we need to sort of help them work that through that. So there was a pilot of the PCG that used text messaging um, to help uh, communicate with patients who have diabetes, and we found improvements in diabetes self-efficacy, foot exams, and medication adherence. And one of the things that we really learned is that they loved the idea that somebody from the healthcare system cared about them. That they want, <laughs> we had a computer sending these messages, but they thought it was our diabetes educator. So they're like, hi Marla, so good to hear from you. I checked my feet. And so, but the idea that somebody cared, like, like really resonated with a lot of our patients. And this, these are patients who I think have a hunger for having a positive relationship with the healthcare system and have sort of some old baggage to try and clear out. And so that was really effective. We're gonna try and ramp that up. Oh, this is just their experience. People liked it. Their changes in self-efficacy improved. And I have to say that for behavioral interventions, it's easy to teach people knowledge. It's really hard to improve self-efficacy, to make people feel like they can actually do something. And that is a, the strongest predictor of not people will do something, is if they think they can do it first. And so for both of these, we've seen improvements in both self-efficacy and what people are actually doing on the ground. For your class or intervention, was there provider-patient racial concordance and do you think that that affected it, or are there some ways where, if, if did you test that, or? Yeah, well, what we decided was, for a couple of reasons, um, so we, we made the video, we had sort of a good scenario and a bad scenario, All, both the physicians were black, so we didn't want to have, like, the evil white man and then the friendly black, well, you know, so, we, <laughs> they just seemed over the top, so we tried to keep it race neutral in, in, in how we talked about things, but we didn't shy away from the fact that there are these issues around race that we do need to talk about. We just tried to separate the um, sub, uh, subclinical messaging with the actual conversation. And then as it happened, the, for that class, the, it was taught by three people, so myself, uh, a nurse who is African American, and a diabetes educator who's white. Is Mark gonna kick me off? Okay, okay, two, okay, so. <laughs> so we're working with potentially community health uh, workers, diabetes group visits. There is something for providers around uh, changing communication patterns and stuff like that. Um, so we're letting, doing a lot of community partnerships. Um, a lot of our work is overlapping with some of the stuff with the Urban Health Initiative. Um, and so that, that's it. So we have funding for this work and then this is just a shout to my co-investigators for all the work that I've done and then my personal funders as well. Okay. Thank you. This is an excellent presentation. I, I have a question about the culture piece mm -hmm. here. Because, you know, we, uh, my limited reading of literature and interventions, everybody talks about culturally detailed interventions and some of this is race related, some mm -hmm. of this is patient doctor related, some of this is something else. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if you were going, uh, so we didn't get a chance to, uh, to talk about what teach was the culture mm -hmm. and whether that was actually involved healthcare messaging based on, uh, you know, like Kevin Reynolds and Cal's work about motivational interviewing and, and sort of having pieces that are targeted, there's some ethical challenges there based on how people are motivated by their own race. So I didn't know if you did that, what your thoughts on that are, and actually what is the cultural piece here? Right, so excellent question, because um, we're actually trying to write this up right now. So I would say two things. One, um, just to acknowledge that our, pop, our patient population is a, a fairly narrowly defined group of black people. So we're not talking Afro-Cubans, we're not talking about you know blah, blah, blah. We're talking about mainly African Americans who came up from the South through the Great Migration. So these are Southern African Americans who happen to be living in Chicago, but they're really Southerners, as am I. And so the, <laughs> I mean, I really was born in Tennessee, not like my parents. Uh, but, um, and so that, that actually is a fairly, fairly narrow cultural group around food practices and around other kinds of cultural things, particularly related to food, because um, my, and so I mentioned that in, in the video, like my grandmother learned to cook from her grandmother. We're not that many generations back from slavery and, and, sh and sharecropping. And so the kinds of food that we were given, which was like horrible, um, to try to make it tasty, we have to add a lot of fat and lard and a lot of different things to pig's feet and animal intestines and a whole bunch of craziness. But so how people were able to eat things that were unhealthy to be able to live. And those traditions, if you go to a store, you'll see some pig's feet pickled in a jar that people are buying still. And so that's not Chicago, that's the South, right? And so 
so those kinds of things. So we had a, a mock grocery store that had things that people were buying in these local grocery stores that people would br bring in, their boxes, their bottles, or so-and-so. This, this is what we have to deal with. How are we going to make it better? Okay, if you have to have, to have, you know, pecan pie, how about we use this and this and this? And so there's a lot of, like, sharing of recipes based on what people were doing. Our nutritionist um, took food logs, and so she had a sense of what people were eating and then would sort of bring to the group um, dietary recommendations and here's a recipe for so-and-so and here's a recipe for so-and-so and there's a lot of that kind of group sharing and learning. The um, African-American community tends to, for several different reasons, be one that has a strong oral tradition and one that relies on a communal sense of storytelling. And so we had that to be a key component of how we were teaching the classes, both the diabetes education and the shared decision-making part. So people love to get up and tell their story. They love to get up in church and do it. We let them get up in the class and do it. And people could learn from each other. And it felt validating for people to be able to share their story and be heard. Um, there's a lot of tears shared, everyone was crying, you know, just, and so there, it was good, it was good. Um, but that, if that way of communicating and being in a very social, friendly way is how African Americans from the South typically relate to each other. And so that context is how we tried to run those classes. So stuff like that. On the national study, could you ascertain at all if the lack of getting foot exams and eye exams and so forth, was there a difference within the same neighborhood, like they would be essentially going to the same physicians, or was it also partially based on neighborhood and so forth, thinking that, you know, Hinsdale probably has more podiatrists and eye doctors than South Chicago? That's an excellent <laughs> question that I don't know the answer to. My, my guess is that the data is not going to be that granular enough to make those comparisons because it's a, but, but it would be really cool if you could. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.